Hi, I'm Norm, and this is the first episode of Strangely Canadian. First of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm going to be doing with this channel. One of my favorite things is to study Canadian history, and not just the traditional history that you can read in books, but that seedy part of history that we don't like to talk about. In today's episode, I'm going to talk to you about my own province of Nova Scotia which is on the east coast of Canada. So Nova Scotia has been a point of interest for a huge number of people for the past eight years, thanks to the History Channel's series, The Curse of Oak Island. But what you probably don't know, Oak Island is only a small part of the mysteries of this province. I'm gonna give you 10 of them, and we're gonna start with Oak Island. So for those of you that don't know the story, Oak Island has been the subject of a treasure hunt since the late 1700s. There are several theories. Captain Kidd's treasure was buried there. Others include religious artifacts like the Holy Grail, manuscripts, maybe William Shakespeare's, and Marie Antoinette's jewels. Located on the eastern side of Oak Island, which sits in Mahone Bay on the south shore of Nova Scotia, is a, a spot called the Money Pit or it was there. It was a shaft more than 100 feet deep. According to island lore, it, was, it first drew the attention of a local teenager in 1795 who noticed an indentation in the ground, according to legend, a block and tackle in a tree. He got some friends and they started to dig, only to find a man-made shaft featuring wooden platforms every 10 feet, down to a depth of 90 feet. The treasure hunt has continued for over 200 years, with many people trying their luck at riches, including a young Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Six men have lost their lives in the search for this fabled treasure. Today, the Lagina brothers from Michigan own most of the island and are the head searchers on the series, The Curse of Oak Island. Their journey is being documented by a film crew for television. Next, New Ross, castle ruins. Not too far from Oak Island is a small community of New Ross, Nova Scotia. In the community on private land, now buried from prying eyes, is what is believed to be the ruins of a castle. There are three possible legends. One, the ruins are those of a Viking structure. And it is historical fact that the Vikings made it to this part of the world long before Christopher Columbus ever, ever sailed to the New World. Other theories include refuge for an English king, from around 1600, or an Oak Island connection. The castle was built by Scottish member of the Knights Templar, Henry Sinclair, when he traveled here to Nova Scotia to hide the Holy Grail on Oak Island. Next, Peggy's Cove. Heading towards Halifax from Oak Island, you'll come across the picturesque Peggy's Cove. The Peggy's Cove Lighthouse, as it is known, to most visitors, is actually named Peggy's Point Lighthouse. The first lighthouse was built in 1868 and consisted of a wooden structure over the top of the keeper's house and used the light from a kerosene lamp reflected from a round silver plated mirror. One mystery is how the area actually got its name. There are three theories. Number one, the short form of Margaret is Peggy. So the cove was named after St. Margaret's Bay. Number two, the cove was named after an early settler who lived in the area. Or, number three, there was a young girl presumed to have survived a shipwreck. She was found on the shore of the cove in, in the early 1800s. She could not speak and had no identification. She was called Peggy by the locals and they named the cove after her. But that's not the only tale from Peggy's Cove. The second tale from Peggy's Cove features the story of a woman who had traveled to, from Europe to Canada, hoping for a better life for her and her two children. Unfortunately, she didn't have enough money to bring her children with her when she came to, to Canada, but she hoped to earn enough to reunite them at some point. Settling in Peggy's Cove, she married a local man. One day, she was sitting on the rocks, daydreaming of her children back in Europe. Her new husband soon joined her, and seeing that she was feeling down, he tried to cheer her up by singing and dancing on the rocks. Now, if you've ever visited Peggy's Cove, there's signs everywhere to not go on the black rocks. While her husband danced, he slipped and fell on the rocks, killing himself instantly. The locals found him later, but there was no sign of 
his wife. Some say she likely felt responsible for his death and she took her own life by falling into the sea. Even to this day, some people claim to see the mysterious lady in blue poised to jump into the sea. And when someone tries to help her, she disappears into the mists of Peggy's Cove. Next up, the Bears Lake Mystery Walls. In Halifax, Nova Scotia is a mysterious foundation and wall. The Bears Lake Mystery Walls have many theories regarding their origins, including a defensive structure for the back end of Halifax, a military supply depot, a training ground for the siege of Fortress Lewisburg, or most recently, a sheep's pen. However, every theory has been proven inconclusive. Next up, St. Paul's Church, Face. On December the 6th, 1917, Halifax was rocked by an explosion when two ships collided in the harbor and the munitions on, on board one ship, destined for the battlefields of War, World War I, caught fire. The explosion was devastating, flattening the city, leaving many homeless and many more dead. St. Paul's Church played a significant role. Doctors used the church as an emergency hospital. It was the only church in the city considered safe enough to conduct services the following day. All the congregations used that specific church to conduct funerals following the explosion. There remains two artifacts in the church from the disaster. A piece of steel window frame that remains embedded in the wall above the inside door to the church and the explosion window, which shattered to form the silhouette of a man's head and shoulders. The congregation concluded that the silhouette is the likeness of Abbey Moreau. Next up, Shag Harbor UFO. On the southern tip of the province lies Shag Harbor. On the night of October the 4th, 1967, shortly after 11 p.m., an unidentified flying object, some 60 feet in diameter, was seen hovering the, over the water near the tiny fishing village. The Shag Harbor UFO, which displayed four bright lights that flashed in sequence, tilted 45 degrees and descended rapidly towards the water's surface. Upon impact, there was a bright flash and an explosive roar. Concerned witnesses began calling the Barrington Passage RCMP. The incident was witnessed by many, including three RCMP officers. A search turned up no results, and the incident soon faded from memory, except for the UFO convention that takes place there every year or so. Next up, Jerome. Now this one, I didn't really know much about until I started to uh, research some different mysteries from Nova Scotia. Jerome was found by an eight-year-old boy named George Albright and brought to the Albright home in the village of Digby Neck to be nursed back to health. Both of Jerome's legs had been amputated just above the knees with evidence that it had been done by a skilled surgeon. The stumps were only partially healed and still bandaged when he was found. He was suffering from cold and exposure. It was discovered that he could not or would not understand French, Latin, Italian, or Spanish. He apparently shunned the attention of these curious onlookers, growling like a dog at unwanted guests. The man's hands were noted as being too soft to be that of a manual laborer, and he was described as being Mediterranean in appearance. The government of Nova Scotia voted to supply a stipend of $2 a week to support Jerome. He would bounce from home to home within a few different communities, all the while never revealing his true identity. He would take this secret to the grave on April the 15th, 1912. Now, if you look, there is an Acadian made feature film called Jerome's Secret. Next up is Black Hole Harbor. If rumors and legends are true, then the largest hoard of pirate treasure in Nova Scotia and perhaps the world lies hidden somewhere in Black Hole Harbor. There's a story of gold coins being found there and strange markings engraved on large stones. About 200 plus years ago, Norwegian pirates set up one of the world's safest banks at Black Hole Harbor. Somewhere in Black Hole Harbor, likely between the Haunted Falls and the beach where the gold coins were supposedly found is a place offshore 
that is very deep and always underwater. Here, Norwegian pirates stored their chests. Once a year, the tide was low enough to allow divers to descend into the bank and retrieve the chests. At all other times, the deposits were safe in the, in the deep hole at the bottom of the bay. Next up, the Great Amherst Mystery. Being from Amherst, Nova Scotia, this mystery is near, near and dear, and we're going to explore the Great Amherst Mystery a little more in depth in a future video. The Amherst Mystery is centered around Esther Cox, who lived in a cottage with her sister, Olive Teed, Olive's husband, Daniel, and their two young children. Also, a brother and sister of Esther and Olive lived there as well as Daniel's brother, John. According to Walter Hubble's account, events began at the end of August in 1878. After Esther, then 18, was subjected to an attempted sexual assault by a male friend. This left her in great distress. And shortly after this, the physical phenomenon began. There were, there were knockings, bangings, and rustling in the night. And Esther herself began to suffer seizures in which her whole body would visibly swell up. Then objects in the house took flight. The frightened family called a doctor and during his visits, bedclothes moved, scratching noises were heard and the words, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill, appeared on the wall by the head of Esther's bed. The following day, the doctor administered sedatives to Esther to calm her down and help her sleep. Whereupon more noises and flying objects manifested themselves. Attempting to communicate with the spirit resulted in tapped responses to questions. The phenomenon continued for several months and became well known locally and around the world thanks to Walter Hubble, an actor and writer who documented the events, he, which eventually he published in a book. There are hundreds of ghost stories and poltergeist stories in Nova Scotia, which I will discuss in future videos as well. For now, I hope you will click like, comment and subscribe below. And I'll see you next time when I bring you more tales that are strangely Canadian.